by the time I get to know Tomas Kitty afterward. Uh -huh. I'm sure That's he'll do a good job of that. Okay, I have got the green light that we are ready to uh, broadcast here. So I, we're doing that. Welcome everyone. Uh, today, John Howe here with Amy Reese. Hi everybody, it's nice to I see you again. Yeah, uh, it's been a while. A lot has happened since we were on here before. Uh, today, we figured it would be a good time to uh, think not a lot has been happening here, but actually some interesting things have been happening here. So we'll take questions from you all on, on uh, what has happened through the season, maybe what is coming up here for next year, and some of the recent things that have been happening here, so, some, some very interesting things between the, the nests and the chorus, so we can cover that. So anyway, thanks for coming today. I guess I first wanted to thank... Uh, the folks at Explore for uh, helping us get this set up and, and get the information out and connect with you all and uh, also our landowners and our our collaborators in Decora that have, have helped out with uh, giving this and, and giving us access to this property and these eagles and, and bringing them to you. So uh, I will get started here now and we will look over and uh, we're getting our questions here from our uh, our Skype window over here so we'll take a look at our first question here so first question have there been any sightings of DN1 near Decora near the Decora hatchery uh, so uh, since this is all new okay I think that's our first question um, so uh, First thing first, I guess, uh, this nest is Decora North, so it's not near the hatchery. Um, it's in the vicinity of Decora, that's about all I can tell you. <laughs> this is a nest that we, we uh, uh, have not disclosed the location of it. So um, with that said, uh, I guess uh, the, the straight answer to the question is DN1 has not been seen uh, south at the hatchery. Uh, Hold on just a second. We also don't have any way of identifying DN1. So if DN1 leaves and goes somewhere else, we won't know about it. We don't have bands on DN1 and we don't have a transmitter on DN1. And really juvenile eagles don't tend to have distinguishing marks one way or another. So once DN1 goes, uh, he or she will, for all practical purposes, be lost to us. So it's nice to think the eaglets might get together, but that's not right. something we're going to know right. once DN1 disperses. Right. So we, we don't know that about DN1. Um, on, a, on a very similar topic, though, I think you know what we can tell you is that uh, we did transmit two eagles this mm -hmm. year, uh, D24 and D25, down at the fish hatchery nest. The, uh, and just recently... Uh, the data that was coming back from Brett Mandernack, uh, the study that he's doing on those two eagles along with his regional study with larger number of eagles over uh, a long time now. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, uh, basically a, a big research study. Uh, we did see uh, evidence that one of, uh, was it D25? That was D24. D24. Uh, the oldest of the two eaglets at the fish hatchery nest uh, in Decora uh, did actually make it up and probably interacted with DN1. And that was just what, last week? Yeah, that was. And we've got some video of that. I can put a link over at the Explore channel for anyone who wants to see it. So, so. kind of funny. I, we thought that was very exciting, interesting. It's like uh, uh, what happened here. We have the city eagle that is visiting its country cousin. I guess that was what we first thought. <laughs> so with GPS coordinates and then also with, uh, I think we did have that sighting of actually two eagles together. Yeah, we did. Uh, so, so we were able to confirm it. Even this time of year when the eagles are not as easily seen just because they're not around the nest uh, uh, near as much. So We've also got another question. Uh, since this is all new, what has been surprising to each of us at this nest? I, the thing that really surprised me, because it's so close to Decora, because you know, you've got a similar weather, similar climate, it's rich in food resources, I really thought we would see very similar behavior to the behavior we see at the Decora main nest, and we did not. 
So to me, that was one of the most interesting things. This nest actually reminded me a little bit more of the year that we watched Eagle Valley. Uh, the male was more, a little more distant. Um, there was less time both parents spent in the nest. Uh, there were only two young in that nest. There wasn't sibling aggression, although not to the degree at the Cora North. But that was what surprised me. I didn't expect the two nests, since they're relatively close together, to have such different behavior. Yeah, uh, and I guess uh, um, there's a number of surprising things. I just talked about a couple of them. Uh, one, we saw a real, real marked difference in the behavior of the eagles in the beginning part of the year. Uh, at the main nest down near the hatchery, uh, we had a man-made nest that, that we started, and they started building right away. But there was two full months there of intense building of the nest. Now, at the North Nest here, uh, they already had the mansion of a nest. Uh, you guys know the size of that nest. It's about nine feet in diameter yeah. at the biggest part. So, I don't know. They built it out big to start with, right? They, they, did, uh, they, did, they did the full uh, spread right away. Um, so, did not see near as much nest building activity at the North Nest. So, that, that was one thing early on that was noticeable. Um, and then I, I think, you know, the one thing that we noticed is the, the, the original Pecora Eagles by the Fish Hatchery, uh, just saying that, by the Fish Hatchery, uh, they were very, very advantageous as to where they've located themselves. So there's an abundant food source there in addition to some of the other mammals and, and other uh, uh, food prey that they bring up to the nest. Uh, uh, so uh, we saw a difference in the amount, I think, and abundance of food, and I think that there's probably a, a larger uh, radius of uh, hunting and food gathering that goes on with yeah. the Decor North nest, and, and we saw that kind of reflected a little bit in how the, the eaglets uh, uh, behaved with, with a little bit more. I think we, we, we did notice marked uh, food scarcity at certain times where uh, we can talk a little bit more about that too, but that did result in some other things happening. And then the third question is, does growing up as a singleton make life, life different off the nest versus the two from the hatchery? And do we think DN1 is female? Uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not gonna guess because I really thought with Decora, Maine, the fish hatchery nest, I really thought we had a male and a female. I was in my head, I tried not to share that opinion, but I was just certain that was what we had. And we didn't, uh, and Brett Mandernack measured the eagles. He knows his business. If he says they're both male, they're both male. So I'm not going to guess because I no longer feel comfortable guessing. Yeah, and, and I, I have no, no way of knowing either. So uh, um, I guess uh, uh, we, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, I guess we can just leave it at that. Um, so uh, let's see. We're on uh, number four here. Is it known if other wildlife animals nearby were affected like uh, DN3 and mom were? Any updates on that subject? So um, I think what we're talking about here is the, the, the poisoning of, of mom and then bringing the, uh, the poisoned raccoon up into the nest. So uh, we pretty much are limited to what we can see from the nest and uh, I guess the only thing that we know for sure that was affected would be the raccoon that that uh, died, and then mom and DN uh, DN two. DN two, yeah. Um, so that's that's really all we know. Um, I guess uh, as far as other wildlife, I mean, we could make predictions and things like that, but really what we saw there is we saw a predator that was taking, uh, you know, a prey, a raccoon, and we know the types of, of prey and food that eagles, bald eagles eat. So there's other eagles out there. There's turkey vultures, others that would that would uh, eat on that type of uh, food prey. So we can only guess that it, it could happen to other uh, birds of prey or uh, a coyote or something that might eat a, uh, uh, a dead raccoon. So. Um, and we want to reiterate real quickly, I, you know, as John said earlier, these eagles have a wider hunting range. We don't know who was baiting, but we also don't believe that it was done intentionally. And we did do an education campaign 
but kind of everybody up in that area. Uh, so, and it hasn't happened again. So we both feel pretty confident. You know, people really like these eagles. Uh, they enjoy their presence. They're proud of being able to have them. So we don't believe that we will see this again. We've also done some education via our website as well and uh, some personal searching on YouTube to tell people they shouldn't be doing that sort of thing in the comments. So uh, just so everybody's aware of that. Right. And if you take a look at the blog post that, that Amy put together, there is some good information that talks about uh, the issue. And it is an issue that has been brought up in, in the central uh, US, northern states, Michigan and Illinois uh, and Wisconsin uh, and some others. So it is an issue that has been being dealt with um, and actually the label has been changed on the uh, Golden Melbourne flybait uh, that's used by, you know, on label by a lot of people that own farms that try to control flies for their cattle or for horses. Um, so it is a labeled uh, use uh, insecticide for flies. So I guess, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be gone. So um, it's just uh, off-label use is, is the concern and the educational opportunity. Yeah. That this to, is to really tell people you, 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 know, you really can't do this. So that's that's sort of what we've been focused on. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Do eagles lay eggs later in the year? <laughs> Number five. Yeah. Do eagles lay eggs later in the year as they breed further north, such as northern Minnesota and northern upper Michigan? Eagles arrive in upper Michigan in March, just when uh, would lay when they would lay and hatch, I think down here is what they were in, uh, implying. So um, we certainly, we definitely see a, a difference between different parts of the country. Um, and that's good for you guys, right? The, you can see eagles in Florida earlier in the year, and then you can kind of progress up through the states and then get further north. And I think, you know, what we're, we're looking here for egg laying um, at that, what, March time period. Yeah, so you're looking at egg laying, you know, maybe February through March. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service actually has guidelines as far as when eagle nests are active throughout the United States. And you have, first of all, like John said, a nesting chronology that's sort of um, seasonal. So you get really early nesting in Florida, and then it sort of rolls out later and later as you go north into the country. But then you have individual nesting chronology. So you're looking at the decora eagles laying eggs in February, right. But the Decorah North Eagles, not really all that far away laying right. eggs in March. And we also saw the same thing actually over in Eagle Valley. They were also right. later later. So, yeah. yeah, and we did ask some of our Eagle expert uh, contacts about even just the difference with the two uh, uh, Eagle pairs here in the Decorah area uh, with a three week difference in approximately in when they laid eggs and when they hatched. And uh, the answer really was there's nothing, at least in the same area that would necessarily make a difference as to why there would be that offset in three weeks. So if with that variability in three weeks, even just in the same geographic area, um, you could imagine that there's uh, um, some variability north of that and south of that, but re very regionally, I mean, if we're getting up from Minnesota all the way up into Canada, I would think that we'd see some differences. There. Yeah, I, I would totally uh, think so as well. Know, with the colder weather so and that's one thing interest uh, interesting with a lot of the different years of, of activity that we've seen and recorded here in the midwest of the u.s in decor iowa is just the impact that weather has with the the snows and ice storms and things like that um totally different uh uh occurrences happening with weather and effects of weather on the nest and activities than you'd have down in, in uh, the southern U.S. Yeah. So. So the next question, number six, why are the other decora and the eagles banded? Uh, so why, why is decora banded when decora north isn't banded and has transmitters? Um, that's really more a question for Brett because this is actually his study. But first of all, we just started working with the decora north nest. Um, the decora the eagles, we have a whole way to go about banding them. We have a methodology. This is, we, just, we do this thing, we do this thing. So we've got a process in place. We don't really have a process for Decora North. I don't know whether they'll be added to the study or not. Um, they, that will really depend on the goals of, of threat right. study. So we'll right. just see going forward. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we, we had an experience and a, a track record and history of 
of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, trapping and putting transmitters on eagles down at the fish hatchery uh, nest. So I think you know that that's what we knew. That's that's what Brett wanted to go with. We had we had uh, two eagles, and I think that that was one of the things of interest. Absolutely, is is, uh, is what happens to sibling uh, eagles. Uh, you know, is their interaction different? And is their dispersal different than just the eagles? And, and the big difference here is that we know where these eagles have originated. A lot of the trapping studies that people have done, uh, they're, they're trapping transient birds. They don't know where they originated. So that's a, a big value in knowing that and what we're doing with the, the, the D24 and D25. Yeah, that's a that good point. were transmitted this year, so, okay. Uh, how can caring raptor and animal lovers spread the word about the repercussions from using methanol and other poisons on wildlife as well as domestic creatures? Uh, I think uh, I think just you know the exposure that this has gotten. It's certainly nothing that I ever expected that we would see. No. Um, I can tell you that every time I saw another piece of prey that came up into the nest after that, uh, we were wincing. Um, uh, it was like, uh, you know, just a little bit of hesitancy to, to wonder, you know, is this another possible one that could have been poisoned? So, um, uh, I'm going to tell happen. you, yeah, I'm going to tell you what, uh, Soar told us in talking about using non-toxic uh, shot for hunting or non-toxic fishing tackle. And that's talk to the people, you know. Uh, certainly you can send them to our website and we're happy to talk to them but what really makes a difference is when family members talk to family members talk to friends talk to people within your own social circle um, I've been kind of surprised actually at the, the number of people I found that know about this personally I've gone on YouTube also and just let in videos telling people how to do this let them know that it was illegal in the comments but right. I think if you really want to make a difference you need to talk to the people that you know about it and uh, urge them to talk to the people that they know about it because uh, you know I understand not everybody wants raccoons they can be a destructive animal but if you're gonna get rid of them you need to do so in a way that's legal and doesn't put other animals in danger so talk to people you know uh, certainly you can direct them to our, our blog and website or come to our blog and website for more resources about it so yeah and it does uh, one of the things that we're working on and, and uh, we'll be doing more of it in the future is putting some educational modules together on, on things just like that. And, um, you know, you can think that this would be a really neat, uh, just short study for students to take a look at a number of different things, including, you know, what the possible effects of our use off target use or off label use of insecticides for things like this and what impact that has on wildlife and also learn about, you know, what is okay for target uh, uh, registration, you know, when it's used properly, and here's what happens when it can it, it is not. So there's some good educational uh, opportunities there for some of the the media that we're planning on putting together yeah, in the next year or two for classrooms. So so uh, um, get the word out and spread the word, and that's a great point that Amy brings up about about lead shot and hunting um, how that can affect uh, birds of prey especially eagles so it isn't just uh, uh, methamyl and, and coca-cola nope. for raccoon control absolutely not so we have uh, number eight number eight thank you in the case of d24 and d25 and the others when they took their first longer flights that seemed they followed water courses uh, or valley systems so this year d 24 did for the most part. D25 fascinated me because at first he did, he kind of crept up along a river system, but suddenly he made this jump of 38 miles over a very flat piece of land of the Mississippi River. Now, if an eagle's up a thousand feet, it can see, you know, roughly 39 or 40 miles. So presumably D25 could actually have seen that sort of interesting looking area beyond all the flat. Maybe there was a wind pushing him north and he rode it straight. But that's really the only one I can think of for a first long flight that wasn't following, you know, river, valley system or something like that. And that was very interesting to me. I think I just actually read that today. There's yeah. some of that about how far an eagle can see when they get up in, in the thousand foot plus level. Yeah, yeah. So, 
uh, you know, when you think about that, uh, they are seeing regionally, they're seeing geography, they're seeing river systems and valleys that they can actually navigate. Uh, they're not just seeing what we typically see from from the ground or even in a, in a you know, a, a small plane that's uh, close to the ground, so. No, they're making me jealous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. We, we yeah we got some exciting uh, uh, video that we might be able to show uh, next year here that uh, would show a little bit what an eagle might see so or a falcon from probably not a thousand feet though. <laughs> okay, we have our hunting or fishing on instinctive behaviors or a combination of both. You want to go first on that one? Uh, I believe that you know they're they're instinctive, uh, but you also see that the parents. Uh, we see it with falcons. We see it with eagles, where uh, the parents are are showing behaviors and they're teaching the young. So it's it's I think both a combination of both. I think it's instinctive. It's also uh, also learned by example. Um, uh, that's. Yeah, there I, are a I'm lot sure. of human behaviors that provide sort of a good analogy. If you think of a baby learning to walk, you know, it'll start to pull itself up on things and cruise, but it's not very good at walking. It has to learn how to walk well, and hunting and, and fishing and flying are really the same thing. Yeah, and one thing I can say with these raptors, it, it is interesting, and this goes to the falconry part of it too, uh, where food is really used as a way to train, and I suppose it's the same way with the circus or, you know, whatever, wherever yeah. you're working with animals, but... Um, with raptors and I'm sure even the type of activity that we're talking about where parents are teaching young, uh, food is used and, and there's a period there when eagles and especially falcons when they fledge uh, that the, they're chasing after the parents just to get at food <laughs> or be the first. <laughs> Amy's doing her, uh, her uh, raptor impressions here, which she's pretty good at. But uh, um, food is used for training. It's used for training for flight. It's it's used to train how to hunt, um, and I'm sh it's the same between eagles yeah. and 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 all other raptors in that way. So, okay. Can you ID DN one by the marking under its wings, the right the white stripe? I'm gonna say no because uh, I've seen enough pictures of you know eagles like this, and they have those kind of white wing tips. I, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is I, I was really amazed whenever uh, DN1 would get wet from rain, how uh, the the dark feathers on top really kind of disappeared, and you saw all these light feathers yeah. underneath. Yeah. Um, and then as soon as it, the the feathers outer feathers have dried off, uh, that there's no visibility of any of the lighter colored feathers. So um, some of the visibility of those lighter colored feathers could be just a temporary thing depending on the position of the outer feathers or whether they're wet or not, I guess uh, um, I, I never really have, have paid too much attention to that. Bob took a very scientific approach to this and he really felt that once they had, uh, excuse me, fledged, once they had fledged and certainly once they dispersed, unless you had a band on them or some other kind of ID marker, forget it. You weren't mm -hmm. going to be able to tell who they were. So that's, that tends to be our yeah. answer. Yeah. Okay, 11. Uh, does RRP have any plans to enter the DN nest to check for archaeological treasures left from the season? Uh, I think uh, uh, we are planning on doing some camera maintenance. We're planning on possibly adding a, a second camera just as another backup, a pan tilt zoom camera up there uh, further away from the nest. It wouldn't require us to get into the nest. Um, I believe that when we did the initial reconnaissance, we did go into the nest, right? Yeah, was it? it was it was interesting. Um, Kike Arnal went into the nest, so he actually did the initial reconnaissance. And then when we came back to put up the camera, it was Kike and Dave Kester uh, at the top of the tree for the most part. So in this particular case, the nest is way out on a couple of limbs. So first of all, you have to get up into the tree. And then because there's not a suitable limb for a crossbow shot that's right. easy to reach, you kind of have to make your way along this limb, which is something you should not do unless you know right. how to do it. And then you have to rerun the rope and drop down into the yeah. nest. So, so I, I think the answer to that is we're not planning on doing that just to go look at the remains. You know, we've seen the, the famous uh, uh, turkey 
wing that probably there's still some remnants of that that are still there. Um, there's uh, it's never going to go away. Gonna so small. Yeah, that's probably going to, and it really is uh, interesting to see how an eagle nest, especially this one, even all the other birds that nested in the lower parts of that large nest there. And, you know, we've seen mice in the nest, mm -hmm. and we've seen lots of other little critters there too. So it is really one big happy family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we probably won't necessarily go into that one unless we really saw a need to. Um, and the reason being is that, as Amy said, it is on a couple branches that are kind of reaching out towards uh, the sun and the opening there. And um, there's a lot of weight. That's a pretty large nest. And if we add the weight of a human to that, uh, we did consider that when, when uh, Neil Reddig uh, uh, did the retrieval of, of DN2 to make sure that uh, DN1 couldn't possibly uh, uh, perish from eating part of uh, DN2, uh, you know, we are very careful about that uh, concern, and that's the reason that he went up there to uh, take care of that. But uh, in considering doing that retrieval, uh, um, three spikes were used to climb up, and Neil actually used a gaff pole to reach out and grab the, the carcass of, of DN2 and pull it aside and drop it out of the nest uh, because of the concern of trying to get out on that limb, doing it quickly, and just the concern that with the added weight of a human, there's a possibility that we could undermine the nest or crack a branch or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of weight out there with the size of that nest. So, All right, the next question is, is there always one dominant parent? If so, is it usually the female? Well, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being anthropomorphic. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, Bob would always said, as far as stick placement, the dominant one is going to be the male. Yeah, yeah. Because he'd always rearrange things and, and always had to have the last say where the uh, branch is. But um, I know that uh, mom always, uh, well, we've seen mom get her licks in too with wide branch shaped sticks and, and tug of war pulling and things like that. Um, uh, I think that what I've seen, and this really, you know, be honest, this is the first year that I have watched in detail with all the camera operation at these these two nests, and that is, uh, it seems like female is on the nest at night, right? Yeah. And um, she's got away with the, with the male. I mean, when she comes to the nest, if he's got food, uh, she she's does got away, and, and it might take a little while, but but uh, that the female is persistent and and coaxing the male to to drop drop food and and give it up to her um, and she typically will be the one who uh, will be able to get the male off of the, the nest bowl and the eggs and and decide what she wants to do and we see that pattern of the female doing most of the, the incubation at night and, and yeah. uh, that kind of behavior so yeah I think maybe it's, it's a little harder it's really easy to look at the young birds who are competing for food and say this one is dominant because it beats the other ones up and gets the majority of the food and we also see that you know we saw that a lot more obviously at Decorah mm -hmm. North a little bit at Decorah Maine and you will also sometimes see that in peregrine folk and right. boxes so right. I think with the adults it's a little harder because you, you can look at these behaviors and you know dad kind of determines a lot of the nest building mom gets the food when she wants it and gets to sit on the eggs when she wants to dad builds the nest bowl and really makes the decisions about where that's going to go yeah. so i think you could argue it either way and the female if you decide it in terms of food the females definitely dominant yeah i think that you know overall the female is making more of the decisions <laughs> I, your first, your first uh, uh, impression. I guess I would agree with that. Yeah. So whether it's uh, uh, anthropomorphic or not. Yeah, right. Whether it's more human tendencies or, or more raptors here. So uh, let's see where are we here. Thirteen. Uh, Thirteen. Have the Canadian geese been a food source? They don't seem to be afraid of the area near the nest. Uh, I have not seen anything brought up into the nest that looks like a, a Canadian goose. No. Um, although we, we hear them and we see them, we know that we're, they're there. Um, we know from Eagle Crest, one of our other cameras out in California. Oh, yeah, I didn't that, even think about Eagle Crest. They will, they'll nest up in a hawk nest. Yep. They, they will nest around raptors, and uh, they don't seem to be afraid uh, of uh, at least the eagles in this area. Um, 
I think they probably are less likely to be afraid of taking over a nest of a red-tailed hawk, maybe, than an eagle. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I guess I haven't seen cases where they've nested in an eagle's nest. Yeah, that's a really good question about the food. We haven't seen it, so I, I don't know. I, I guess I'll go looking for that once the conversation might, is might, over. I'm very yeah, curious. It might be big enough that uh, the eagles would not try to uh, take one, and they might be... Uh, uh, they might be healthy enough that there's not Canadian geese roadkill around because we know that eagles are scavengers and, and they'll take live fish and they'll take some other stuff live, but a lot of the, the prey that they get is already uh, deceased. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next question is for me and it says, can you explain foreshortening as it pertains to the size of the decor and nest appearing smaller than it actually is? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now that's a little bit too complicated for me to try to do without really thinking about it carefully. I tend to think with my fingers and not so much with my mouth, but basically when you have a camera at a nest, the angle of the camera relative to the nest will influence how the nest appears. It can appear larger or smaller. If you think of tricks in photography, there's a famous one with a spider on the web, a camel spider. It looks massive, and they are big, but they're not that big. The, the camera was positioned uh, close to the spider and kind of tilted up so it looks bigger. This camera is back a little bit and looking down at an angle. It's also a three-dimensional surface that's flattened into a two-dimensional plane because it can't, you know, essentially camera's two-dimensional and it's a surface being mapped onto a globe. So that can distort depending on where the camera is relative to the nest itself, um, how the nest appears. That is a subject since if you have an interest in it, that's something I can try to do a blog on here in our little bit slower season when I'm looking for things to write about. So uh, let's see if I can pop that one up in the next couple of weeks yeah, for you. So, so the foreshortening, I guess I'm not familiar with that term, um, but uh, uh, you know, that is one thing that really is deceiving with especially this nest <laughs> is that it is it's so large that uh the eagles and eaglets that are they're in the nest make uh, the nest makes them look smaller so uh, there's probably not a whole lot of distortion from the actual camera and the image as amy is talking about the positioning can make it look different but the sheer size of that nest makes the eagles look smaller uh, than they, they are. Uh, if you want to have a reference for eagle size, uh, take a look at a human and you know visualize from waist level all the way up to head level, and that's about the same footprint of a of a bald eagle, an adult uh, or close to a uh, bald eagle. So um, that nine foot diameter nest, if a, if a six foot person is laying across that thing, there's three feet of freeboard on one side or a foot and a half on either side yeah, so yeah. Um, that nest is uh, it's quite large so it does make them look smaller. Okay John I'm going to ask you this question do we expect there to be any long-term effects on mom as a result of the poisoning? Um, uh, I haven't specifically gone to look at uh, methamyl it, it's a, a carbamate pesticide uh, what we did experience there was that we had carbamate toxicity of that chemical. It looked like mom had uh, that first night, later in the night, we could see evidence that she was starting to recover a little bit through the night. And then by early morning, she actually was balancing and, and actually got to the edge of the nest and then was outside of the nest uh, less than 24 hours probably after she ate it. So uh, it was most likely metabolized. Um, I can't answer as far as whether it bioaccumulates and what kind of, uh, you know, persistence it would have, but uh, some, some chemicals that do bioaccumulate that don't break down as easily, uh, the persistent organochlorine, insecticides and pesticides like DDT and other toxophene and others that have been banned, uh, they don't break down and they do, they're hydro, hydro, uh, hydrophobic and they tend to partition and, and get into body fat. So uh, that's where the bioaccumulation happens. Uh, most of the ones that are used, and I think that is the case with these organophosphorus insecticides like methamyl, they're not as persistent. The, the body uh, can, can metabolize and break them down. Uh, so there's probably not as much of an issue of toxic buildup or bioaccumulation in the tissues of the, the bird. Uh, in this case. So 
that's a great question and that's a good one to check into because uh, um, each organic chemical does have what's called a, a mm. organic mm. partition coefficient that helps you identify how much it will go into fat tissue versus uh, be metabolized in, in the body. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, that, I was probably getting a little yeah, bit more Yeah, that's helpful scientific. to know. Um, we did look up the MSDS material safety data sheet for golden mallory. Of course, we don't know for sure that this is golden mallory. It's just in a class and tends to be used for that. And while it didn't, it didn't talk about the things that John was talking about, so I'm really glad that you did that, it does say that there are not any known reproductive effects. So we don't believe that there'll be a reproductive effect right. absent repeated exposure. Right. And th I think the, the effects that we did see were, were more neurological, neurotoxic type, type effects, which uh, um, I think those are more of an acute uh, uh, systemic type of a, uh, poisoning that can be metabolized and then recovery as opposed to the long-term chronic uh, effects that could you know, persist and actually affect the health of, the, of mom in the future. So we'll study that a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, absolutely. But, but Thank a great you. Question. Okay, let's see, where are we? Uh, uh, 16. Was the sibling rivalry due to the shortage of food sources? Um, we, we don't know for sure, but I think we thought that that probably was a yeah. good, good part of it. Because really what there was was conditioning going on there, and it was all around food. So as soon as mom or dad would come with food prey, uh, DN1 was the, the biggest and uh, the most aggressive, and it, DN1 conditioned DN2 and DN3 to basically stand off and, and sit back and, and let me have my first uh, choice here. So um, I think it's really ironic. We were just talking about the whole thing about the poisoning. Uh, it, it is really ironic that you know, oh, DN, I felt so bad. DN1 would have been, and I, I can't say that there's any reason to favor one versus the other, but but DN1, uh, you know, in the one case where it would have really had a, a, an effect, a life or death effect on on DN1, DN1 had been fed and was was uh, resting in, in a food coma, if you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, uh, just didn't uh, care. And didn't care, and, and DN2 was the one that, that got fed the... Uh, the, the the raccoon that was uh, was uh, poisoned. So, um, but definitely the the food shortage of food or just uh, you know larger area that that the the core north eagles had to forage for food uh, had an effect um, um, on eaglet behavior. And it was really uh, I mean there were some interesting points there yeah. where we saw some. It looked like some really uh, strategic behavior where uh, DN2 and even DN3 would put their heads to the side and they would kind of move around, back around the parent and put the parent between DN1 and as soon as uh, there was food that was available would grab towards it from the other side of yep. the parent yep. where uh, they were, were protected. So some very interesting behaviors that we we saw there just to try to avoid that and, and really conditioning from from DN1 to its siblings. This is a little bit of an aside, but another one of our uh, Eagle expert panel, Jim Greer, who's been banding bald eagles in Canada and other locations for years, told us that when he's gone into a nest, sometimes he'll see a dynamic where you'll have one eaglet that's upset and the other one just sort of immediately goes into a submissive position as the band, as the bander enters the nest because that conditioning has gone so deep that it's like Ooh, something's going on. One's like this and the other one's like this. Right, right. Um, and then we had that one, I thought it was really interesting, and this is a little bit off that subject, but that interesting video in the middle of the night where DN2 uh, rumble at night or whatever. With DN1 <laughs> and and uh, said, I'm your equal now. And then and then that kind of started. Now that backfired. <laughs> uh, uh, that backfired, but yeah, yeah. So we now have a question. John, I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. Can you tell all of us that haven't been watching all along what happened with the poisoning? So a quick outline of the situation around the poisoning. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess that was a work day for me. So I was busy working and came home at the end of the day. 
uh, started looking at the cameras and uh, uh, noticed uh, um, some comments about uh, had, had something happened to to uh, uh, mom and I, I started actually taking a look through the records and and look back and could see that there had been an instance of uh, a change in behavior with with the N2 and that it had stopped breathing uh, and that was about the same time where where mom was uh, not able to even stand up oh that was terrible and it was it was very tough to look at uh, mom was not able to stand up she was glazed eyed uh, not looking good at all it looked like very dirty I don't know how what where that came from yeah. but her white uh, plumage on her, on her, on her head and neck, um, everything looked not normal at all. Um, but one, I just remember a stunning image of one wing kind of forward and one back, and just that glazed stare and and just breathing that looked very labored. Uh, and so that that was the point where. Uh, you know, I know I know that everybody didn't necessarily agree with this, but we just decided we didn't want to show an adult uh, eagle dying on screen, no. which very well could have happened. Um, so uh, we did watch the the eagle uh, eagles through the the evening. There, it rained all night, and um, did see that same behavior. Yeah. Uh, the glazed eyes, the panting, and not much movement through the night. Uh, there was later in the early hours, I think it was around 2, 3 o'clock, where, where she actually looked like she got some sleep. And then by morning, uh, she was up and starting to move. And as I mentioned before, by mid-morning, she was actually venturing and, and, walking, or, and walking over to the edge of the nest. And I think by late morning, had ventured out onto the skywalk or, or, or the, 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 the branch that... Uh, partial nest branches had been moved up and she was out there. And by the end of the day, uh, she was actually flying out of the nest, had recovered uh, some yeah. some trout, some food, and had brought it into the nest and was feeding uh, the N1. So uh, I'd say probably it was about a 24-hour yeah. yeah. um, uh, situation with going from the initial toxic effects, and we don't know how soon before that she had eaten what she ate, yeah. which which caused that to her. But we know when she brought it up into the nest, and we know how long it took to uh, uh, have its effect on DN2. So the next question is, can you compare the difficulty factor in climbing the Decora North Nest with the fish hatchery nest? Um, I actually haven't climbed the Decora North Nest. I've only climbed the fish hatchery nest, but in watching people climb, I, I would say getting into the nest at Decora Nest at, at Decora North is a lot harder because, like we said earlier, nest is out here, tree is here, so you have to climb up, and then you have to attach yourself and climb out along the limbs. You have to bring the rope with you and then rerun the rope so that you can get down into the right. nest. Whereas in Decora, Maine, Decora Fish Hatchery, it's just pretty much a straight shot. You take a crossbow, you shoot a light line, you pull a heavier line, you pull your climbing line, and then you go up the rope. And it's not physically easy, but it's a lot easier than getting into Decora North because you don't have to redirect the rope or climb out along a limb. Yeah, the structure of both nests and Decora is main trunk of the tree, some split off branches, and then you've got the nest right in that, that area that's right by the main trunk of the tree and the main branches that come from that split. Um, uh, I've, I've been up in N1, uh, have not been up in N2 You've yet. been up in N1 twice. <laughs> yeah, right. Doing camera work, uh, that's a fun place to do soldering and electrical work up in the Eagle's Nest. So um, might get it, probably get a chance to here coming up in September. We will do some archive and, uh, archival digging and see if we can find the, uh, the egg that didn't hatch uh, at N2B, which yeah. is the other nest there. Um, so we will do some of that, but uh, yeah, big difference in the structure there. Uh, not near as easy to get into the nest at uh, Decora North. No. Okay, we have, uh, sorry, uh, why did mother not feed eaglet number two and what happened to number three for those who missed it? 
Well, I guess what we've learned, what I've learned from just watching is that the parents will bring the food to the nest and, and it's not like uh, equal rash, rationing of food. It's whoever comes close, uh, the parent will will tear parts of food apart and whichever whichever young is there to grab it, whether it be falcons, whether it be eagles, whether it be hawks, is going to get the food. So. Um, what the, the big the big change that we see is the competition between them if there is uh if food appears to be plentiful we don't see as, as much of the competition and the conditioning that we saw we've never seen that kind of competition and conditioning at the other uh decor nest uh, in the fish hatchery itself so um not that i'm aware of no that we haven't seen it there i don't recall seeing it in port st Vrain. and there's a little at eagle valley do you rewatch it but again nothing nothing yeah. to this degree yeah so um you know hunger drives that with the young and we've seen the links that an eaglet dn3 even the difference in size with all the all that happened you know with the the, the tossing around by dn1 and some of the things that were really hard to watch um, with all that conditioning that happened, even uh, just you know the hunger uh, kicking in and, and uh, instincts kicking in, and, and DN three finding ways to get over towards the parent, yeah. and you know coming from the different sides, yep, and doing yes. whatever you could do, and, and DN two is doing that also. I uh, DN three might might in my opinion, have made it if we hadn't had those two days of soaking rain and the parents were also really not attuned to DN3 brooding right. needs and the other two right. already didn't need kind of that extensive brooding. I also think it's hard for human watchers because we think of our own kid and, you know, if big kid walks over and bops the baby on the head and steals its food, you're going to be like, no, you quit that now. You are going to your room, right? So we think, hey, these are eagles. They obviously care for their young. Uh, or they wouldn't be feeding and, and taking care of them and providing the care they do. So why don't they do that? And it's they don't think like us. They aren't human. That's one of those areas that I think is really uh, perplexing and difficult, especially to, to first-time right. viewers, because right. we expect that based on our own experience, but they aren't like us. Right. And and what we learned, and I think what we tried to explain to people, and we saw in the end, is, is that type of instinctual competition and all those things that those eagles eaglets are learning, you know, that's basically preparing them for the competition that they're going to have out, out uh, when they get out of the nest and they're fledged. And, you know, the statistics that we hear are that, you know, only 20% or so yeah. of, of these eaglets or falcons are going to uh, make it past the first year. So there's a lot of competition there. Um, some of these behaviors are uh, their, their centuries, you know, they're 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 learned over the centuries yeah know? so absolutely uh, that that's that's bred behavior that has helped them survive and and that that's what we see so it uh it's tough to to watch it and it's not what we would do um so uh that's that's the big difference from watching these live cams versus uh uh what happens when either eagles are in captivity and they're being fed by humans or, uh, you know, I guess at a situation where the food is very plentiful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's hard, but it's important to remember that they're, they're, <laughs> they're wild animals and, and they're not like us. Right. Okay, so we also have, uh, what are the chances that three eagles in a nest will continue to fledging? And have we seen this very often? So, uh, well, we've seen it. Uh, we didn't have three that hatched. At the, at the southern decora nest this year so but in, a, in all we've other seen years, it over and over and over yeah, in decora yep in all other years we had three eggs which is not the normal we know um and and all three hatched and all three made it yeah so we've also seen that at port st brain and in fact what tends to kill the eaglets at port st brain this is in platteville colorado it's right on the front range on the east side of the rockies um what we've tended to see there will kill the eagles as not in fact lack of food, although there are food issues at that nest uh, sometimes, um, or sibling rivalry as weather. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think when there's plenty of food, like John said, when there's plenty of food and when you've got cooperative weather, yeah, there's a real good chance we'll also survive. Right. 
Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, John. John, do we ever need any volunteer cam operators? Yeah, yeah. Um, we do, and I, I think we luckily have way, way more people that uh, that, that want to volunteer to do that than than we can probably use. So we get to uh, uh, pick and select, and um, you know, from what we've done uh, specifically, I've had the opportunity to get to uh, offer that and. and and train some people in and, and have them help out with uh, panning and tilting and zooming the cameras and uh, switching between cameras, which is a, a little bit different uh, with the systems that we've been using here. So um, uh, we do need them. And uh, I guess we'll see as we go through the season here, uh, We, the people that we've trained, obviously uh, we've invested in that training and and they're people that we've uh, worked with before are probably our first uh, options and choices. And then, you know, if it gets to the point where uh, we want to have a little bit more depth to make sure we can have coverage there, uh, we're looking for, for new people to help out. But yeah. up until this year, most of all the camera operation in the Cora was done uh, with a joystick on controller. On location. On location. <laughs> so... Uh, and we still did a, a good chunk of it that way at the main Decor Nest. Um, not so much at Decor North because it's a residence that that uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, habitated all around the year. So, um, and that's about as much as we can say. So, um, since we're on the subject of volunteers, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our volunteers, yeah. cam operators. You guys were fabulous this year. Uh, I loved watching it. All of our Ustream moderators, you guys are awesome. Thank you for what you do. Our Facebook moderators, uh, you guys are fantastic. I appreciate the work you do answering questions and producing comment. And thank you also to our volunteers and moderators on explore.org. You guys were absolutely amazing. Right. And there were a lot of challenges at the Decor and Nest this year and that you did a great job meeting them and answering questions. So thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and and that's, that, that is a huge part of, of what we do is, is getting this out and, and the volunteers that are helping with the moderating the chat and, and uh, I'm always amazed at all the different things that are brought up during the season uh -huh. and archived <laughs> and, and uh, we got to see that and you get to see that uh, as the uh, the rewinds on our on our uh, on our Ustream version of the Decor North Nest uh, uh, our Facebook uh, uh, um, uh, manager, operator, helper, Sherry, put together a bunch yeah. of the, the, the sites and videos, uh, photos with, with captions, and, and there were a lot of photos in there. <laughs> we looked at all the different uh, things that happened through the year and all the interesting things that happened. And, and I myself, you know, if I've had a busy day and I haven't had a chance to be watching what was going on, uh, the first thing that I will do is go to the Explorer site or to Facebook and I'll look at the posts and I'll look and see what people put Catch on there up, yep. and get caught up with some of the videos. I, I don't know if we thanked our, our videographers either. Oh, I don't think I did. Uh, thank you, videographers. Yeah. You are so helpful. We curate you on YouTube, and when we miss something that's going on, you definitely right. help us know what's going yeah. on. So, right. and uh, so, uh, we're, and we're we're we we're used to what we've done in the past uh, with Ustream, so it's it's a neat opportunity to get to learn how the system works with Explore and. Everyone loves the uh, rewind function there on, on the uh, feed that's going off to explore and just uh, the ability to go look at those videos and, and capture them. So it's a, it's a great interface. We love it. So I've got the question, has the landowner ever had any trespassing issues? Uh, no, it's usually not a good idea to go poking around on farms that are where you're not wanted. <laughs> I don't have any stories about this farm, but I have some stories about some other farms in the area yeah. that I'm not going to share right now. So no, not as far as we know. Yeah. Uh, does it seem rare that an adult eagle can steal an osprey? So I don't know if we're talking about, was that Hog Island? I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, that happened all of them last year and then one this year. That's right. That's right. So no, it's really not especially rare. Uh, there's a fair amount of competition between eagles and osprey. They're in the same space. They share some of the same prey base. Uh, so I can't say how common it is, but I can tell you, I don't think it's probably especially rare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even from, from that 
just one site yeah. two years in a row. It's not rare at that site. Um, I don't know if it's the same eagles that are, are predating and, and taking the, the young osprey or, or what, but... Uh, um, yeah, certainly one thing that would be interesting to know is if there were active eagle nests in the area, because that would tell you something about the, the predation right. that was occurring. And it's going to be also dependent on where the eagle nest and the os or where the osprey nest is too. Um, at a, in an area like the Cora uh, North, uh, there's probably it's not by uh, a large riverine system like the Mississippi River Valley, or in the case of of uh, Hog Island, there's there's a large body of water there. So, with lots of mackerel. Right, right. <laughs> Usually so, I watch our camps, but I did occasionally watch that one. <laughs> right, right. So obviously if, if they're, the osprey nests aren't close by, it's, it's not going to happen with the eagles. That would be like a decor north. Yeah, yeah. They're sticking to their hunting territories usually yep. unless you had a drifter floating through. Yeah. So let's see. It's 4.56. we got about four minutes left here. Somebody asked, do you think DN3 seemed to be stunted in growth, or why do you think DN3 seemed to be stunted in growth uh, almost from the beginning? We got that question a lot, and we might have different opinions about this. My own opinion was that he, you know, he was six days younger than DN1, and if you look at early footage, there didn't seem to be that much of a difference. I think he, first of all, I think he was at a bad point in the growth curve because when eagles hit about you know, between 14 and 20 days, I mean, they just go like that. Their growth curve goes crazy because they get all of their physical development or almost all of their physical development as far as their weight and size by the time they're right around 40 days. So they have to go through this insane period of growth. So it was my opinion that DN3 only looked smaller because he was kind of got the short, he, he, I don't know if he's a he, because DN3 got the short end of the stick on that. However, we might have a different opinion on this. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, as the, well, we saw a little bit of a difference in, in the amount of food that was being brought in. And although DN3 was getting you know, chunks of food, probably not, you know, full crop full. So, you know, if you're getting fed every day, but you're only getting a bowl of food versus you're getting a full plate. Yeah. Um, and you're in a, in, a, in a high growth development area. Uh, of growth, I think you know you're gonna you're gonna put on more poundage. You're gonna get bigger. So I think there was a little bit of a difference in lag because of food supply. But as Amy mentioned, there was a big enough span in in the days between hatch that in the growth curve, uh, DN3 would have been really getting to that spurt point. Yeah. Um, but so maybe a combination of of hatch order and food availability drove some of the difference in size. Especially the thing that struck me. It was right before the turkey wing, you know, when they were all playing in the turkey wing, which was around May 1st, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, initially, before then, they looked roughly right on track, and it was right, right around that before right. the DN1 just seemed to pull away. So, I, you know, food availability certainly yeah. could have played a yeah. role as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. It seemed that the DNN pair are much less vocal than other nests. Could this possibly be the cause for Dad Moore's lack of provisioning? It's an interesting idea. Uh, I've certainly read some papers that suggest that parental investment is driven in part by mate behavior. So I, I don't know that. Yeah. I don't think I, we can rule it out. I know in one case where we saw some commenting about uh, why isn't Dad bringing anything into the nest, um, we knew that we had some issues with some transient eagles, some sub-adults, and some other intruders uh, that were coming through. So it, it, some of that depends a little bit on what's going on around the area and whether there's any challenges from other eagles or others. Uh, so if the male is tending towards uh, defending the area, um, is he going to be spending as much time tending to bring in food prey? Uh, I don't know if that might have had something to do yeah, with some of that. Yeah, I would tend to think if he had a lot of nest guarding going on that he's probably not going to be spending as much time hunting. And it did kind of surprise me um, that we saw so many, you know, so many makes it sound like they were darkening the sky, but we did see more sort of nest intruders and, and area intruders here than we did down in the hatchery nest. And that surprised me a little bit. That's a, a dynamic we also saw at Eagle Valley, actually, because... Yeah. That's right in the middle of a huge, you know, one of the biggest flyways, really probably in the world, yeah, Mississippi right. River Flyway. Right. So he was constantly vigilant against juveniles and sub-adults and adult eagles, and that easily could have been part of the puzzle there right. as well. Right. 
So uh, five o'clock here. How much weight can a bald adult bald eagle lift? I'll tell you what. I think this will be maybe our last one. Okay. Um, I'll answer one more question after that. So we had a whole big long discussion about this with our panel of eagle experts after the Barry <laughs> College eagle was seen bringing in a branch that she dropped and someone later weighed it and it was like 11 or 12 pounds, which would have been in the area that she's in probably roughly about 100% of her body weight. What our expert panel concluded after a lot of discussion about this was that eagles can generally carry about 60% of their body weight. However, you could have conditions in which they could carry more. So for example, um, if they catch a duck, ducks, some ducks are pretty big, or a Canada goose, because mm -hmm. you know they're pretty good size. Yeah. If they drop down on them, they're going to have lift on their side. They're not dead lifting. And, then they're, and if they have a favorable wind, they're going to be yeah. able to glide and therefore carry a lot more than they could otherwise. So my answer to that is, you know, what we concluded was about 60%, uh, but there have been cases of eagles seen carrying more weight than that. Yeah. It all has to do with lift and momentum. Yeah. And... Now, one thing that is interesting that we observe quite a bit uh, is eagles actually breaking branches off from up in the tree. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. They're not, they're not necessarily picking them up off the ground. In fact, we got some video footage and, and a bunch of situations where they're actually flying out off of the nest or coming in. They're kind of diving in towards the nest, and they're grabbing and knocking and, and busting a branch off and then circling around and flying back and bringing it to the nest. So that would fit in with your, your yeah, momentum. Yeah, completely, completely. Having that, that uh, speed and momentum to get the lift to be able to bring something a little bit heavier on. We know, I don't know how much that uh, roadkill, you know, black and white cat was, but <laughs> or should I bring that up? But, uh, I, or some of the fawn parts they bought in the nest, actually. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I, if you've... If you've been paying attention, you might have heard a cat in the background here today, but um, ours weighed around 12, 15 yeah. pounds. So I don't know if that, that was a smaller uh, roadkill fed cat that was brought in. That could have been close to 8, 10 pounds. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, we know that uh, I can't even remember if it was mom or dad that brought that up in there. Um, the last question we're going to take is, what is the greatest distance a tagged eagle has tra traveled? I'm going to tell you right off, over all of the eagles that have ever been tra tagged, I have no idea, but the greatest distance one of our eagles has traveled is about 920, 930 miles north. That was D1, who flew north to Polar Bear Park, and I believe it was between 920 miles and 930 north of her natal nest uh, was yeah, the farthest amazing. north she ever got. Ama an amazing travel. Yeah. So. yeah. And we would have never known that nope. without doing that type of study. So there's some, some neat uh, uh, science and, and things that, that we are learning from, from the tracking of the eagles with the transmitters. So. so, John, is there anything else you would like to tell our listening <laughs> audience? I, I think it's time to say goodbye, folks, and uh, uh, thanks for watching. Um, we, we really appreciate your attention. Um, we're, I think... A lot of people were asking about how long are we going to be broadcasting here. Uh, if you hadn't seen, we're decided that we are going to do our maintenance here. We'll wait till uh, end of August here. We'll be working on that in September. So I think it's Sunday the 28th. Yeah, I want to probably. say it's Sunday August 28th. Maybe just, uh, Amy and I might join the chat that night, and we'll just uh, do a little bit of quick Q&A type stuff. But uh, uh, so thanks for watching. Thanks for your attention. Um, this is really an opportunity to get connected with what happens in, in the wild and, and uh, what, what the rules of Mother Nature are. And, and uh, I think that from the letters that I get in and that we get from people, we know that there's a lot of people that can't necessarily get mobile and get out, outdoors. So uh, um, really, it's, a, it's a really a privilege to be able to be part of a group that helps bring some of this uh, the folks like you that are able to watch the interesting antics of these raptors, these bald eagles, and uh, and get to experience that and look forward to it and, and watching that. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be going here for another week or two, yeah. and then we'll shut down for a little bit, and then we'll and see then we'll be back. what happens with the 2016-2017 season. So thank you for watching with yep. us. Thank you.